also not holding back in a denouncing President Trump. MSNBC's Jacob Soboroff asked the former congressman whether another mass shooting could happen while President Trump is in office. It will happen again because what happened in El Paso is not an isolated incident. After the president warned of caravans, you had somebody go into the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh, um, warning of caravans. Um, you had the mosque in Victoria, Texas, burned to the ground on the day that Trump signed his executive order seeking to ban Muslim travel to the United States. So there are very real consequences to his words, to his tweets, um, to, to the racism that he fans. You in May at a rally in Florida, he says, how are we going to stop these people, meaning these immigrants, from coming to this country? Someone yells out, shoot them. The crowd roars their approval. He laughs. He laughs. He says, that's okay with me. You've been very clear that you believe the president is a racist. Is the president a white supremacist? He is. He, he, he's also made that very clear. He's dehumanized or sought to de dehumanize those who do not look like or pray like the majority here in this country. He said, I wish we had uh, more immigrants from Nordic countries because those from Haiti bring AIDS. Those from Africa come from nations. Um, he's been very clear about who he prefers to be in this country and who he literally wants to keep out with walls and cages and militarization and torture and cruelty. Jonathan, obviously Beto O'Rourke has been front and center during this. That's his hometown. That's his former district. Um, he's been passionate about it, and you can understand why. But you see really all the candidates from Joe Biden to Cory Booker to Beto O'Rourke drawing a stark contrast in the way they talk about the shootings and the way they talk about the country after the shootings from President Trump. You, exactly right. And I think your conversation with Professor Mitra in the last block is uh, highlights where we are right now. Is the Democrats, at least for the moment, are setting aside some of the policy differences that they may have with each other, and frankly, even some of the policy differences they have with the president. And they're speaking on much more moral terms. They're trying to suggest that he has lent license to what has happened. That he has, the president has fostered this environment of hate with his words and actions that has led to not just the violence, but people living in fear, that, that people across this country being afraid that they could be next. Even yesterday, this is, you know, so many public officials, including the, the current congresswoman for El Paso, has spoken about how Latino residents feel like they have a target on their backs right now. And then what does the president do last night? He goes on Twitter and attacks a Latino congressman, Congressman Castro. There is a sense that a, a real fear among people that, that, that he is leading to this. And I think we're seeing Democrats and Joe Biden, certainly yesterday, he has perhaps been the best at this from kickoff video that started with the word Charlottesville, but we're seeing Senator Booker, we're seeing Congressman O'Rourke. Elizabeth Warren last night echoed O'Rourke's sentiment that the president was a white supremacist. We're seeing more and more of that, their willingness to call out the president, what he has done and what he has said. And from the White House's perspective, someone close in the Trump orbit told me last night that part of the reason why the president reacted so strongly yesterday, he's always thin-skinned, but in particular, he's sensitive to receiving blame for these shootings, that he is aware that his words are being judged as the fuel for this violence, and that's why he is lashing out and so desperate to control the images of that visit yesterday. Is there any self-analysis whatsoever? This is a question I think I know the answer to that's taking place. Is there anyone maybe not self-analysis, but within the West Wing, other people saying, hey, I don't blame you for the shooting, Mr. President. I don't think you didn't pull the trigger, whatever, whatever. But perhaps we should tone down the way we're talking in light of what we just saw, in light of those people you saw lying in hospital beds. Is there anyone in the West Wing who can get that message to the president? There's certainly no evidence of any self-analysis. And time and time again, there's been a lack of anyone on the senior staff who says that to him. An example about his fight with Elijah Cummings in Baltimore. There were a number of people in the West Wing who expressed to me and others who were very uncomfortable with that oh, line of attack from the president. White House employees. The, they're uncomfortable. The, they're uncomfortable but, working but the, for their racist regime. No question. But oh, the I point just... being, they didn't feel like they could say anything and they didn't feel like he would listen. This is just pathetic. It is pathetic. I am just so sick of everyone has excused it away for so long. And now after what happened last weekend, I certainly hope to God we're going to have a sea change in this country in terms of how we're addressing race and how we're addressing Donald Trump's blatant bigotry on a day to day basis. You look at what's happening on the border, you look at the children in cages, you look at how we don't have enough resources to properly take care of all these children that have been forcibly separated, yet we do have 600 ICE agents to go in and raid a factory farming plant in Mississippi, while the billionaire CEO, I have a feeling that he's going to be fine today. But let's go. Let's keep targeting the, the most vulnerable among us.
You've led us to our next story, Elise. Coming up, ICE agents raid small town Mississippi, targeting a workforce made up mostly of Latino immigrants. It's being called the largest workplace sting in more than a decade. And as you can